Oh, hi! This week, it's the new year. I thought I'd try a challenging project, make myself do some math and do some patterning, which is not my strong suit, and make a dang button-up A-line skirt. I've been wanting to do something like this for a really long time. What sealed the deal for me needing this to be a thing I know how to do is when I saw this photo Rachel Maxey posted of this amazing 70s looking skirt, or maybe just the way she styled it made it look 70s, and I wanted it. So if you wanna see how I went about it, it is my little sewing diary. There's a lot to get through, so let's jump right in. Now, I'm making a pattern from scratch. I promise it's super easy. I never know if it's more practical for y'all when I use a commercial pattern and tweak it or when I make a pattern from scratch because then you can make it to any size and you don't have to work within the parameters of the commercial pattern sizing shit. Where I want to continue my skills in pattern drafting but I also like testing stuff out on commercial patterns so there's going to be a mix of both. I'm just curious what y'all like to do. So before we draw any lines on some paper we gotta figure out what numbers we're working with. Trigger warning I suppose I'll be mentioning my measurements. I have put on some weight in the past couple months because I had COVID and then a wild bout of depression that I'm finally coming out of. Thank you, Will Butrin. This is a judgment-free zone. I just wanted to remeasure stuff because, you know, our bodies fluctuate and I wanted to meet myself where I'm at, which is also something I'm trying to be better about. So my waist measurement, like the small of my waist, generally the navel's a good spot to go by and you don't have to do a high-waisted skirt. I just like when things sit there. That was 33 inches for me. Then I measured my hip measurement, which isn't actually where your hip bones are. You want the biggest part of you. So basically around like the peak of your butt. So for me, that is 43 inches. Then I measured from my waist to that hip point, which was about 10 inches. And then while I was doing that, I measured from my waist down to about where I wanted the skirt to end. And I wanted it right about knee length. So 23 inches is what I was going for, but I figured I'd just write down 24 for my length. So that would include an inch for the hem. And those are the four numbers you need. So I'll put them again up here so you can see. And I'll draw out a little diagram and point out where all of these measurements are going to go just in case you can't follow along on the video. If you're interested in making something for yourself, again I'm just showing you how I went about this. I will do a sketch with a bunch of notes and put that pattern up on my Patreon page. It's free for everyone. It's just a good hub. I have a bunch of bag patterns up there and I think a gathered skirt pattern. So once I had all my numbers written down, I jumped over to my cutting table, rolled out a big thing of paper, and then immediately messed everything up because I only cut the numbers in half. I was thinking, well, this pattern piece is going to be on fold, so I only need half the measurements, but I'm going to have a front and a back to the skirt. Just thought I'd try that out having a whole garment. <laughs> and not just a red wool merkin. <laughs> so the lines I'm gonna be drawing, I'm cutting my measurements into fourths. So 33 divided by four is 8.25, so eight and a quarter inches. And then 43 inches divided by four is 10.75 or 10 and three quarters inches. So I drew a line for the waist measurement and then I drew a line for the hip measurement and then I connected those two ends. And then I realized that's a bit more drastic of an angle than I really wanted because I don't want the skirt to flare way, way wide at the bottom. So then I drew a line at the hem line, so at the 24 inches, but I just eyeballed the width on it and I did move my ruler so that it was a less extreme angle and just like a much more gentle slope to get to the bottom. So basically my waist to hip was like this, but I didn't want it to keep going out that far for the hem. So I started my waist and hip this way and then the next curve was a little more straight. It wasn't until I started working on this skirt that I realized, ah uh, yes, this is why sometimes there's darts on skirts, because if I made that slope from the hip up to the waist less angled and straightened it out a bit, then I'd have extra width at the top of the waist. That's what the darts are for. So if I had done it like right around the small of my back, maybe taken in two small darts, that would have eaten up some of that width so that I'd still have the same measurement for the waist, but it would also add some shaping heading down towards the hips. Listen, I'm still figuring this stuff out and this is how I have to learn. I'm a hands-on learner and it helps me so much knowing like why the thing is there. Where obviously I know like boob darts are there because there are boobs to account for and it just hadn't fully occurred to me that like, yes, you can taper the skirt out, but so you don't have extreme angles because I have a 10 inch difference between my waist and my hips. That's a big discrepancy. So there's ways to account for it. So you don't have crazy geometric shapes going on for the side seams. I'm obviously figuring this out as I go. Isn't everybody, I suppose. So once I had all my lines connected, I also needed to add seam allowance. So this piece is going to be cut on the fold. So this is going to be the back of the skirt because the front is going to be where it overlaps. So this can be 
one whole piece, so we don't need to connect anything in the middle, but the side seams are gonna get attached to the front side seams. So I'm gonna add half an inch for seam allowance along there. And then this pattern's ready to cut out. I did even label it. This is not the most fine penmanship, but it gets the job done. <laughs> then I traced all that back out onto another section of paper so that I can make the front pattern piece. Some skirts, it's the same front and back. Often when I've cut skirt patterns, the back has been two separate pieces and the front has been cut on full because I usually do a center back zipper, but not this time. We are doing buttons, even though I was really scared. <laughs> Maybe not scared, but I knew it was gonna be involved and I tend to like avoiding that. <laughs> but we're here to learn and challenge ourselves and get better at this. So once I had that back pattern piece traced onto my paper roll, I then took a ruler and figured out how wide I wanted the placket at the front. In retrospect, I should have picked out what buttons I wanted to use for this, but I hadn't even picked out the fabric when I was drafting the pattern. In future, if I use this pattern again, I can make the placket wider if needed. I'm actually really pumped I figured out something I liked or didn't like or wasn't working and have like a way to troubleshoot it because for me I feel like that's how I pick things up better is almost like if the thing goes wrong I'm more likely to remember it and how to fix it for next time so anyway for whatever reason I just thought an inch and a half wide placket looked good it felt right in my heart so I added an inch and a half to the width of this piece now I should have traced the pattern further in so that I could add the placket width to the straight side, which was gonna be the center front, and would have just been one straight line to do instead of redrawing this like two different angle side. I kept adding to that one, even though it was clearly more work than doing it on the straight edge. We live and we learn. So yes, I'd recommend <laughs> adding these new marks that I'm putting on on the other side of the pattern that I was doing it. Also, because I traced the back pattern with the seam allowance included, I don't have to add it to this pattern. It's already there, already accounted for. Normally that's something I forget, but I did start a new medication last week and it's helping me like keep more shit in my head. So like my working memory is a lot better, even though I still mess stuff up and had to work through things and like figure it out as I went. And again, troubleshoot. A, it wasn't as stressful. B, I didn't feel like a terrible person for it. And C, it just wasn't happening as often and I was able to course correct a lot easier. So if you're unfamiliar familiar with button plackets. There's probably a bunch of ways to do them, but the thing that made sense in my head is I want the center of my skirt to overlap. In addition to my waist measurement, I need a strip where the buttons are going to go and where the buttonholes are going to go to be added to the waist measurement because they're going to be overlapping and I can't take away from the waist measurement or it's not going to fit me. So that's why I'm adding that inch and a half to what I already have here. But then I want a nice clean edge, so I'm adding another inch and a half so I can fold that behind it. That folded edge is also going to get some interfacing to give it some structure so that the buttons and buttonholes don't just shred through the fabric and make it fray or anything. It's going to help reinforce it and also give it some rigidity. I have more thoughts on the end and like a question for, for the bog trolls that I'd appreciate some feedback on, but that's for us to worry about later. In total, I added three inches to my skirt sides here. Then this one was ready to cut out and then I marked my notes. I'm cutting two, not on fold or anything, two separate pieces, but mirrored pieces. So I still folded the fabric when I cut it out, but I didn't have to keep them attached to each other. They were separate units. And then I was ready to make the waistband. The first mark I made was incorrect. I had just done a bunch of patterning where I used my waist measurement, but quartered, where the waistband doesn't have to be in four pieces. It can be in two pieces or just one, ideally one. I didn't have enough fabric, so I did have to do it in two pieces, but we'll address that in a second. So I started with my eight and a quarter inch measurement, realized oh no, we need to double this. So that made 16 and a half. And I laid it out so that this was also gonna get cut on fold to give me that full 33 inch length. Still had to add seam allowance. So I added a half an inch at the end. The waistband is also gonna be part of the button placket. So I had to add that inch and a half twice. So an additional three inches. And then that was ready to cut out. The waistband will be getting some interfacing. So will the folded under bit of the button placket, but I didn't have a pattern piece for that to trace. And because it's on the straight center front of the skirt, I just drew a strip that was an inch and a half wide and as long as the skirt is, although I guess you don't need it where the hem is gonna be, and then cut that pattern piece out too. So I have notes on my waistband piece that say cut interfacing and then this separate interfacing just for the placket pattern piece. So four pattern pieces in total. Then it was time to pick out the fabric. If any of you remember last year, I got a pile of vintage dresses from someone I used to work with a long time ago. It feels like a lifetime. Yeah, I was a teenager when I worked with this person, but she gave me a bunch of dresses. A lot of them I couldn't wear some I did like a study on to figure out what kind of stuff they used that I've never seen before. And this red dress really inspired me to try pleating. That's on my list of goals for 2022 is to 
deplete some stuff because it feels like a lot of work, but no, it doesn't have to be. And gathering stuff is also a lot of work. So like, why not try different things? I would like to give it more effort, much like I'm doing with the buttons. I know how to do buttons and buttonholes. I have made probably hundreds of button up shirts when I worked at a costume shop and we had to just make a ton of inventory. So I don't know what this hurdle is I have in my brain, but we're jumping over it today. Back to the dress. There was a bunch of staining and damage done to the top, but this fabric is so nice. The problem is these pleats are pressed in there. Because this dress wasn't going anywhere else, I figured I'll use this fabric as a mock-up. A lot of the fabric I have is too lightweight and I want like a nice, dense, full of body skirt. Where I do have a pile of denim and I think the next attempt will be out of that. Though I'm terrified to see what my machine does with trying to do a buttonhole on that many layers of denim, but you know, we'll see. There's always hand-bound buttonholes too. I'll make it work. I pressed this fabric so much. I spritzed it, I steamed it, I steamed it again, I pressed it again, I steamed it again, I pressed it again, and yet it still creases everywhere. But for a mock-up, we'll go with it. Oh, and because this was already hemmed and it was pretty much at the length that I wanted to with the hem done, I did undo the blind hem stitching that was on it because it was kind of falling apart. I can only guess how old this skirt is, like, minimum 40 years, which is alarming to think that the 80s were 40 years ago, but I digress. <laughs> I was able to cut my pieces out, though I did have to turn the waistband the opposite way that would have been ideal to cut because there's a little bit of stretch in the fabric going widthwise, but not up and down but there just wasn't enough material there for me to get the waistband out sideways so I had to go vertically. It's still doable. I wanted the waistband to have structure so it's not the worst thing. You gotta work with what you get, you know? Oh and as I mentioned I had to cut the waistband into two pieces so I just had to add an additional half inch seam allowance when I cut both pieces out so that when I attach them I wouldn't be losing any of my waist width. Then I cut out some interfacing. Normally I'd use like a lightweight fusible interfacing but I have so much of this woven material left because two of y'all sent me a bunch of SF 101 interfacing by Pellon so I can make my t-shirt quilt, which was my first project last year, which feels a little bit full circle to start using more of that interfacing today, a year after I tried it out for the first time. It's just that this interfacing especially is super expensive, <laughs> but because I had so many narrow strips left over from making the t-shirt quilt, it's perfect for using up for waistbands and plackets. Sometimes things work out even better than you think they will. So here are all my pieces. I have the back of my skirt, which is just one big piece. I have my two front pieces. I I have my two waistband pieces, I have my waistband interfacing pieces, and my two placket interfacing pieces. So I like to do the interfacing right away once I'm in the groove of actually assembling a garment. I don't have to stop and do extra ironing and pressing. I already hate when I have to get up and press the seams and everything, so this just gets it all done ahead of time. Also, it's cold, so if I can do a bunch of ironing at once, it kind of warms me up. To add the interfacing, I just laid the fabric wrong side up, ran the iron over it, tried pressing some of those pleats out again. Felt fruitless, but it warmed up the fabric, which helps when you lay the interfacing glue side down. I was putting mine right on the edge. So for the waistband, I just did half the height of the waistband because it's getting folded over and I don't need both layers of the waistband to be interfaced. Just what's going to be facing the front. Spoiler alert, here's the finished skirt, but I mean, I just want this half of the waistband to have the interfacing, not the part that's folded down on the underside. We want some rigidity, but we don't have to go that deep in the paint. So once the glue side of the interfacing is touching the wrong side of the edge of the fabric, I just press the iron down. It doesn't take too long with this particular interfacing and I had it on the wool setting and I shut the steam off. I just try not to like move the iron around too much when I'm pressing it down, literally just like plonking it down, lifting a little bit, plonking it down again and putting some like elbow into it. That's definitely not the phrase I mean. Putting some elbow grease into it, putting some oomph into it. You want to add some pressure is what I'm saying. <laughs> so once the waistbands were interfaced, I took the front panels of the skirt and that straight center front edge on the wrong side again, gave that a little heat, placed the interfacing glue side down on that edge. I didn't need the hem part that's getting folded up to have interfacing, so I did cut my piece a little short, just if you're looking at it and you're like, why isn't it all the way to the bottom? It's not the end of the world if there's interfacing on that part that you're hemming. If you're unsure how long the hem's gonna be, it's okay. It's just extra bulk I didn't wanna mess around with, and since the hem is already pressed in here and I know where it's getting folded, it's just gonna make my life easier. Once those four pieces were interfaced, I surged the non-interfacing edge of the waistband, so the side that's getting flipped 
to the inside of the skirt. And then I picked opposite sides of each waistband piece to then serge because those are going to be the placket edges that are going to overlap and I don't want any raw edges sticking out there. So just one side each but make sure they're mirroring each other and you don't serge both lefts or both rights. And then I surged the placket side, like that interfaced edge, the center front of the skirt. Cause again, that's gonna get folded under and I don't want any raw edges. Now we're finally assembling things. <laughs> Listen, we got through an entire pattern drafting session and that was a decent amount of fabric prep. Ooh, we're getting so much done. So you don't necessarily have to go in the order that I did, but I just find dealing everything with the waistband first makes my life easier. So I attached the unsurged edges together. Again, if you were able to cut this out on fold and have it all one piece, you don't have to worry about this part. So stitch that together. I pressed that seam open because this is going to be completely hidden and folded over. Neither of these edges of the seam are going to be exposed and it lies nice and flush when you press it open like this and it's going to be at the center back. So it's going to look a lot neater and there won't be any raw edges. So it gets pressed open. I don't know why I'm over justifying this. Back to pressing. I did fold the waistband in half. So having this inner faced halfway does make this part a lot easier. Just fold it along that line. So I press that really nicely. I did pin it in place just to keep everything as straight and crisp as possible. Sometimes things can get a little wavy and uneven when you have a big long strip like this. Then I also, while I have the iron out, measured in from the short edges an inch and a half on both edges, pressed a nice crease there because that's going to get folded up at the end and like why not do it now? So I did that at both edges. Then just to get it out of the way, I took the skirt front panels and folded over that center front that was interfaced nice and easy folding that over it's very obvious where the edge of it is so I just pressed a nice crease along there then back to assembly steps I took the back panel and lined up one of the front panels right sides together at the side seam marked a couple pins sewed it together did the same on the other side. I also surged each of those edges and pressed the seams towards the back. This is wool, so these seams got a little bulky. I feel like it was hard to press like a nice crisp line like you get with quilting cotton. Oh, it's so it's so good when it's super crisp. Tell me you're a sewing nerd without telling me you're a sewing nerd. Then it was time to attach the waistband. I actually folded the back panel of the skirt in half just to find the center point. Marked a little notch there. You can obviously do this when you're cutting out your pattern, which would have been the smart time to do it. Oh, also it's the interface side of the waistband that is going along the top of the skirt because that's going to be facing out and the uninterfaced side is what's going to get flipped towards the back. Now, since this waistband edge is interfaced, so it has little give to it. And also because we cut it on the wrong direction of the fabric that has even less give to it. And the skirt was cut with a little give to it width wise, and it's not interfaced. It may be helpful to stay stitch when you first cut these pieces before you start manhandling everything because it can stretch things out. And that's probably actually what happened here. When I laid the waistband down, I put that on the bottom. These are going right sides together. And I just kind of shimmied the fabric around for the top of the skirt and like really took the time to make sure it lined up evenly and I wouldn't get any puckers and there wouldn't be any weird bits. There wasn't too much slack in any one spot. It was evenly distributed and put more pins in. Honestly, more than I usually do, but I really wanted this to look nice and I'm trying to whole ass the thing, not half ass the thing. When I sew stuff that has a layer that kind of needs to get eased into the other, I sew with the looser, stretchier one on the bottom and the stiffer one on top. I don't know why, it just seems to work better this way. Even though I had a walking foot, which means I had feed dogs moving the top and bottom fabric through at the same time. Sometimes if you have a stationary sewing foot, it can like drag a bit and you have your feed dogs going underneath. So sometimes that fabric on the bottom can get a little bunchy. And again, I didn't want any puckers going on here. When I'm holding the fabric, normally I have my hand behind the machine. Like say you're needles here. <laughs> you're pulling it from the back. What helps here and generally in sewing, I try to make this my practice. So you're not pulling from the back and like putting strain on the needle. I pull against my hand in the front and like hold the fabric and guide it through with both things. So like the tension and tautness here is between my hands and not me pulling on the needle. Cause that's also how things get warped and break and bent. Not that that's definitely not gonna happen if you do this, but it certainly helps minimize it for me. And it's giving that extra little pull, that extra little give that made all of this line up exactly perfectly. I was so pleased with how the waistband went together. Mm. Weird how when you take times to do things nicely, they tend to turn out pretty all right. <laughs> Once the waistband was attached, I pressed that seam I just did up into the waistband. This is a thick, chunky seam with this wool and this interfacing, so it took some elbow grease. I put my elbow into it and really like forced it up there. I did steam the shit out of this. Then because we already pressed the waistband in half, it was very easy 
to flip that waistband down, I did have to turn the placket side in first and then fold the top down. So that's gonna give us our little edge here. So again, I pinned everything very nicely, making sure the bottom edge, that surged edge of the waistband is past where that waistband seam is because we're gonna stitch it from the front and it needs to catch on the back here. Important note, I did widen the seam allowance when I attached the waistband so that there was a better chance of this actually overlapping and sitting that little bit lower. But I added like an eighth to a quarter of an inch. It wasn't anything extreme. I just shifted my needle as far left as it could go. So once that was all pinned and looked super nice and neat, flipped it over and we're gonna stitch in the ditch, which is where you get that needle going right in the crease between the waistband and the skirt. It also helps if you spread the cheeks a little bit, like you kind of put some pressure going left to right and try to expose the top side of that seam as much as you can to really let the needle sit in there and get the stitches as invisible as possible. So the general assembly of this is done. You see by my shimmying that it seemed to be a good fit. Ready? Breathe is buttonhole time. I made sure to save my scraps. I generally save my scraps and put them in dog toy stuffing bin and what have you, but I had two decent sized pieces that I could use to test this out on. So because most of the placket is two layers, I wanted to make sure I had at least two layers of the wool to test stuff out on. Oh, and I have an automatic buttonhole foot. I know not every machine does this. Honestly, I've done buttonholes where you do a wide zigzag, like bar tack at the bottom, do a skinnier zigzag up one side, do another bar tack, and then do another skinny row a little bit to the side of the first one. You can jerry rig it. And I did almost do this because I got really frustrated with my machine, but the goal was to practice buttonholes and really get comfortable with it and kind of add it to the routine of things and not always default to zippers and other stuff. Cause I like how they look and it's not that much work once you've messed around with it. And you know what's gonna make it easier to do buttonholes is me doing it more often. It took a lot of test batches because I forgot to pull the little toggle down that adds the pressure to the buttonhole foot that makes it move back and forth. It's been so long since I've used it that I completely spaced it. So on my machine, there's two dials you turn to the buttonhole setting and then the width of it, I do prefer all of it at its widest and I find the machine does a better job. Like I find less issues happen when I set it to the widest setting. So to figure out how long the buttonhole needs to be, beautifully, this buttonholer, you put the size button you're using in it, it's like a little tray. And then doing that, it like moves things around in a way that it knows how long the buttonhole needs to be. Sewing machines are so fucking cool. I know it's a very simple mechanism. It's just spring loaded and everything, but the joy it brought me when I figured this out, what a great problem solve, because I'm sure that was a big issue is figuring out how wide to make the buttonhole. Cause it's hard to see what's going on underneath the buttonhole or foot. Once I was finally happy with it, I did take my seam ripper and just, just to practice cutting it open. It can be a little tricky to get the hang of, and I'm sure I've cut through some before. This is why I don't tend to use scissors for it, even if they're sharp and pointy at the end. So a seam ripper seems to be the best method for me and my ham fisted ogre hands. So then I was ready to mark out the buttonholes on my skirt with this cool contraption I got for Christmas. It keeps the spacing of everything even as you're deciding how far apart something needs to be. And if you're putting multiple things on like buttons, it's just brilliant. I love it. Simple yet effective. This one doesn't go super wide between them. So I did have to alternate and I'll be honest with you. I don't like how I placed the buttons once I tried it on and I should have like safety pinned a couple spots or at least figured out where I wanted the bottom button to be. I think that was the nugget of information that was missing. I kind of eyeballed it so it wasn't at the very, very bottom, but I also wanted more leg room and that would have had the buttons closer together, which would have had less gapping between the buttons and honestly probably would have solved a lot of the problems that I had with the skirt. This is one of my least favorite colors to wear. So it's not likely this was destined for my actual closet anyway, but we're here to practice. We're here to learn stuff. Oh, also I got to finally take out my giant button collection, which feels excessive to me, but maybe isn't all that daunting for some of you, but I don't use buttons very often. So I was just really pumped to pick some out. And I was debating between two different ones, but I decided these wooden ones were a better match. And they also had two holes. So it was gonna be half the work to sew them on. And I did have five of them. So that's why I decided to do five button holes. So since I had practiced a bunch, I knew I had the right width length. Everything was working well. I think I did like 15 test buttonholes and it wasn't until like the last couple ones that it finally went smoothly and the machine wasn't giving me grief. I say that, but then when I was on the second to last buttonhole, the bobbin came like 
unthreaded from the bottom and was causing a bunch of weirdness. So if you haven't cut your buttonhole open yet, you can restitch it as many times as you want. And especially on a wool like this, where it's a really tight weave, the stitching holes were completely invisible when I unpicked this thread. So I just took a seam ripper and just took my time and very gently picked all of that out. And then I started over. I did use this Choco marker thing, which just leaves a light dusting layer of chalk on top of the fabric. Sometimes when I use chalk pencils, it really gets in there because you're kind of rubbing into it. So I especially have an easy time getting this chalk off of the fabric because listen, they're buttonholes. That's the outer layer of this skirt and it's center front. I didn't want any of this showing. And the best way I have found to get chalk off of fabric is to take another part of the same fabric and rub it against itself. I also use this to get deodorant off of my shirts if I've already applied some and then go to change. And I wear a lot of dark clothes, so it happens pretty frequently. Pretty quickly, I have to say, all of my buttonholes were done. It did occur to me that I've seen buttonhole essentially chisels and my partner has a big ass wood shop, which is actually where my cutting table is. He let me take over one of the workbenches and what he gets for not watching my videos is I will use his tools sometimes. So <laughs> I took one of his chisels, a spare block of wood that was in our like burn pile. I don't know if a rubber mallet was better than like a normal hammer because I've never done this before, but I think the kit I saw for buttonhole cutters had like the rubber mallet and it worked okay. It did make a nice clean line though obviously if there's like even the littlest shift you're cutting right through where you might not want to be cutting and there's no taking it back where you have more control with the seam ripper. Then I laid the opposite side where the buttons were gonna go down first and then I laid the buttonholes I just cut over top, lined up the edges, like took my time and then I just took a colored pencil, a chalk, whatever, and just like drew a line. I have one inch wide buttons so I knew it was gonna cover up whatever marks I was making here. I just basically traced inside of where the buttonhole was so it had a line there. So so that way I knew like the height of where all the buttons were going. And then I measured in three quarters of an inch since my button placket is an inch and a half. Three quarters of an inch is the midway point. That's my thinking there. Oh, also the buttonholes, because my button was an inch wide, I measured in a quarter of an inch so that there was a quarter inch either side. Since I only had half an inch of wiggle room, I kind of divided that in half either side. So it was close. Again, in retrospect, probably would have made the bucket. Bucket platen. Mm-hmm. Can you tell I've been in my studio for a long time today? <laughs> in retrospect, I would have made my button placket a little bit wider had I registered how wide the button was going to be. So some machines come with an actual button foot. It's usually like some kind of peggy thing that probably has a very small surface area at the bottom and just like holds that button in place. For my machine, I actually take the feet off. So then the little leg, I guess, that I snap the sewing feet off and onto that has a flat edge on the bottom and is meant to just put that presser foot down and it just holds it in place. I also set my stitch length to zero because you don't want the feed dogs moving it anywhere or it's gonna break all the needles. So to figure out the width of the stitch, I literally just hand crank and watch where the needle goes. Typically, most buttons I've done have been at the widest setting. Take the time to do this or your machine will be very angry and just shatter all the needles. It's never not jarring for me. <laughs> so yeah, I hand cranked it, made sure it lined up. I put my machine on the slowest setting so I didn't get too buck wild and then did maybe 10 to 15 stitches here. I like reinforcing it a lot and a little fray check on the back side never hurt anybody. So I did that for all five buttons and then it was time for the try on. Okay, obviously this still needs to get hemmed. I was gonna hand hem all of this, but this isn't something that's actually gonna go into my wardrobe. This was more of like a test run mock-up. But normally this is the point where I'd be hemming and I'd be hand stitching this little edge right here. So that was nice and neat on both sides and didn't do this. But for the try on, I just safety pinned the hem up. I'm really happy with the shape this has. The only real problems I have are with the pleats you can still see and is driving me nuts. And also this is very much not my color. As I was saying with the button placement, I think I needed to move that bottom one up a couple inches, which would have helped with the kind of gaping that's happening. Like it's not sitting nice and flush in the front. And this is where the question I have for you is, do you tackle this kind of thing differently? Do you add layers of interfacing to both the front part of the placket and the folded under bit? Do you just make a point to have the buttons closer together? Is that like the crux of the issue? This is why I don't title these tutorials because I'm also trying to figure stuff out and just testing things, trying to get better at this. So if you have any thoughts, please let me know. But overall, I really enjoyed the challenge of putting this together and I drafted a new pattern. Once I finally figured it out, it felt like really good about myself and that is new for me. Speaking of wild self-confidence, Bert has presented himself for attention. Yeah, 
that's the project. I'm really happy with all the work I did and I definitely leveled up my sewing and my patterning skills with this one. Oh, he's biting his little lip. He's got a little snaggle tooth. And like I mentioned earlier in the video, I'll have all the measurements and stuff that I have and the breakdown and a little sketch of my pattern up on the Patreon page. You have full access to it, whether you donate or not. And that's available to everyone because of the folks that do support me on Patreon. They're why any of this is happening. I wouldn't be able to do it without y'all. And I can't believe we're starting another year with so many of you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for letting me do stuff. I get to be better at my favorite thing because of y'all. The biggest hugs in the world to all of you. I hope your new year is starting off on a good foot. Bert and I are gonna go make some black bean and sweet potato chili that I've been craving all day. And we will see you back here next Friday with another video. Thank you so much for hanging out. Maybe your glamour is not in Boston, but my friends are fucking awesome. Anybody can wear a skirt. It doesn't have to only be a lady. <laughs>